I'm back. You're listening to the Hour of the Time. I'm William Cooper. And I'm Carolyn Nelson. Folks, let me give you a little clue. A good way to remain healthy, irregardless of what you've been hearing on the past few episodes of the Hour of the Time, don't drink old eggnog. Food poisoning is not fun, and that's where I've been. Playing not fun after being food poisoned by some old eggnog. And remember I told you that I had some problems with some of the theories expounded by Alex Loglia. Well, if you take that to its fullest uh, <laughs> exponential meaning, um, it flies in the face of what he said. And uh, that's why we always tell you don't believe what you hear anywhere or what you read anywhere. Always make sure that you verify it in your own research. I'm not saying Alex is wrong. I'm just saying that we have some problems with it here, but we thought that he had done so much research and put such hard work into those four uh, tapes that we needed to air them and let you make up your own mind because that's what the Hour of the Time is all about, folks. Disseminating information that is not normally heard anywhere. If we know that it's true here, if we've done the research, we tell you. If we don't know, we'll tell you that. If we have some doubts, we tell you that. So uh, make sure that you act accordingly, please. I'm going to read some letters tonight, ladies and gentlemen. Dear Bill, I've been listening to the Hour of the Time on WWCR for several months now and have learned much. You have confirmed many of my own suspicions, and I am repeatedly amazed, both that so many are asleep and that so many are awakening. Keep up your good work. Please send me a Kaji info pack and merchandise list. If my SASE is the wrong size, I apologize. Thank you, and strengthen your faith in God and Christ, Bill. He is our Savior, and now is the time. God bless you and your family and Sugar Bear, and you too, Carolyn. And this is from Rex in Pennsylvania. And uh, Rex showed that he has been listening to this program for quite some time. He uses a little sarcasm there with his uh, part of his sentence, Now is the Time. Those of you who have been listening to the Mystery Series and been keeping track of this broadcast for, for uh, well, I don't know, for quite a while, then you know what that means. And here's the next one. We do occasionally get these real bad letters, folks, and we, in the interest of fairness, don't hold anything back. W. Cooper, a legend, if only in his own mind. I recently heard another talk show host speaking on the JFK story. I got a real big laugh out of one comment which stated that Willie, or Billy Cooper, is still going around spreading his ridiculous analogy that the driver shot JFK. This is among the most ridiculous things I have ever heard. It sure as hell tells me a whole lot about Will Cooper. You are totally out of it, man. What the heck are you smoking? By spreading this type of newspeak, crapola, you clearly identify yourself as a person to be incredibly cautious of. You are either one, the meatball of a meathead's just plain dumb, or two, you are one of uh, the Luciferians in sheep's clothing. My guess is both of the above to a large degree. This is the same self-righteous Mr. Cooper who badmouths real Americans with zero, uh, and I can't say that word, folks, proof. People like you who twist and turn the bloody truth into their own demented delusions are people who are most responsible for the state of this screwed-up world. No doubt you will enjoy worshiping Satan in the near future. But face reality, Willie. The side of good will come out ahead and send you off into your black hole when the final judgment comes. Be prepared to be exposed for what you really are. You are disgusting, mystic man. Electric gun all, and I can't say that word again, right, dumb, dumb, dumb. Uh, there's a scribble down here which we cannot read, and there's no return address on the envelope. And folks, what you just heard is something from a complete total airhead, who didn't even examine anything that I said or any of the proof that I have to offer, nor has he heard what we have said about these so-called real Americans, obviously. This is not one of the sheeple folks. This is one of the stupid creeps out there. We don't mind criticism if you've got something to say and some proof or something, but uh, attacking people's character attacking them personally is not the way to do it. If you want to argue with me or debate me on the facts, you're welcome to call in when we have open phones. And as long as you're polite and you're smart and you got your facts, you can talk as long as you want to. And if I'm wrong, I'll admit it. 
but attacking my person, my credibility, or my family, or any of those things, is what socialists and stupid airheads do. If you want to attack the facts, do it. And the reason that you don't is because you can't. Dear Mr. Cooper, I listened to Tom Valentine's rerun of the program he recently did with Fletcher Prouty, and I am astounded that Colonel Prouty thinks us so naive that we do not know the CIA was responsible for the 1963 coup d'etat in Saigon. In late October 1963, I was living in Kanagawa Prefecture, Japan, a student at Sophia University in Tokyo. As was my custom, I listened every day to the Voice of America. On or about 1 November 1963, the slow English program was giving the news. Here is what I heard. Quote, the United States government, State Department sources said, would not look with disfavor on a change of government in Saigon in the near future. Unquote. On the 3rd of November 1963, Dong Van Min moved against President No Dinh Diem and his brother No Dinh Nu. That State Department source was Roger Hillsman, Under Secretary of State for Far Eastern Affairs. Proudy knows this, but he chooses to say that big men acted on his own initiative. I agree with you that Freemasons on the highest government level conspired to kill both Kennedys, John and Bob Kennedy, were Irish Roman Catholics. No Den Diem was also a Catholic. If the Mafia had anything to do with the assassinations, it must be thought that the Black Hand is as old as Garibaldi and Mazzini, both Freemasons. Sam Giancana was probably snuffed because of what he knew about the Kennedy murder and the subsequent silencing of Lee Harvey Oswald by Jack Rubenstein. By the way, I was stationed at NAS at Sugi with the 1st Marine Air Wing in 1959-60, to 60, while in the H&MS 11 barrack in late August of 1959, there was a fellow who sat on his rack every day and preached to Marx and Lenin, the benefits of Cuban communism under Castro. Each afternoon, this fellow went over to Navy side on the bus and into the building that housed the ONI, Office of Naval Intelligence. I never got his name, but I think I know now who he was. I was then Corporal E-4, um, Donald B. Clerken, U.S. Marine Corps, somebody who supposedly knew Oswald at Otsugi when questioned on the recent CBS program, quote, who was Lee Harvey Oswald, unquote, said that he pulled at Liberty in Iwakuni, 600 miles south of Kanto. The two towns Marines at Atsugi pulled Liberty in were Yamato and Sagami Atsuka, the latter more a Navy town. And this is from our friends at Euro-American Alliance, folks. Apparently they decided to get on the team and stop causing dissension here. We believe everybody has a right to believe whatever they want to believe as long as they don't hurt anyone else in the practice of their beliefs. Thank you for the letter. Now I have a little article here from a California paper in the summer of 1993, and this comes from Frank Brown, entitled Deadly Doctors. Editor, as previously reported, the 1990 Harvard Medical Practice Study suggests that each year 150,000 people die from the negligence of doctors. Since there are about 300,000 doctors in the United States, that means each year approximately one out of every two U.S. doctors kills a patient negligently. Over a 30-year career, this could mean the average doctor would kill 15 patients. Since there are about 200 million guns in the United States and about 30,000 people die annually from gun assaults, suicides, and accidents combined, each year an American gun has a 1 in 600 and 6,666 chance of killing someone. That number is 1 in 6,666 chance of killing someone. This means that any doctor in any year is 3,500 times as likely to kill someone as any gun. Even the raw numbers are astonishing. Doctors kill five times as many people as guns. Think about it. Should we be turning in our guns or turning in our doctors? Come to think of it, why is the AMA pushing gun control? Why don't they do what they're supposed to do and practice doctor control? And this is signed Edgar A. Sutter, M.D., Doctors for Integrity and Research and Public Policy, San Ramon, California. Well, we get all kinds of goodies here. Now, it's lap time, folks. Somebody sent me this, a CADU member. From Connecting Link, whatever that is, Connecting Link. 
says the Federal Reserve has been sold. Can you believe this? The Federal Reserve has been sold. They've got all this gobbledygook on here. On September 23rd of this year, the Federal Reserve Banking System was sold to the United States Treasury Department. I've heard this from Scott Hildebrand and Merv Haig, both prime movers in bringing it about the sale. And folks, I can tell you this, they are both a couple of the biggest con men that have ever rode a horse through this country. It says for a contact person in your area, contact Professional Wealth Insights. Professional Wealth Insights. Guaranteed to take your wealth and put it in their pocket. They're at 3510 Kimball Avenue, Suite C, Waterloo, Iowa, 50702. That's 3510 Kimball Avenue, Suite C, Waterloo, Iowa, 50702. Their phone number is 319-232-7707. That's 319-232-7707. If you want to lose your money, call them up. They'll send you a little form you fill out. You send it back to them for $300, and they guarantee you that you're going to get several million back once the Federal Reserve is forced to pay us all back for what they've ripped off. Ho, 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 ho. Boy, I'll tell you what. P.T. Barnum was right. There's a sucker born in every minute, and these people are raking in the coins. I want to go back a little bit to that, uh, I guess it was the... The second letter that I read. Whenever, whenever I reveal something about someone else, folks, if you've been listening to this program for very long, I don't attack their personal lives. I don't attack their religious beliefs. I don't attack their family. I give you the facts about what and who they are, and I usually back it up with proof in their own voice, in their own voice, ladies and gentlemen. And if we don't have that, we give you the facts as we know them and references where you can find it. So, all these little twits out there who, <laughs> well, never mind. It's not even important enough to talk about. I've got one more letter to read, and then I've got something to disclose to you that's going to blow your mind and absolutely confirm everything that I've been telling you. Uh, but first this one. Dear Mr. Cooper. I listened to your radio program tonight on shortwave radio and feel compelled to write. I was deeply and profoundly moved by what you said about the Vietnam War and the experiences of those who fought there. I think that for the first time I am beginning to understand why some veterans of the Vietnam War have had the problems they have had. Beyond that, your comments on the ideals and motivations of those who fought have helped to bring me to a better understanding of the problems of those my own age. If you have a moment, I would like to share some of my thoughts with you. I was not in Vietnam for the simple reason that I was too young, having been born in 1957. I don't know whether or not I would have gone to war or avoided it if I had been faced with the decision. What I do know is that the social turmoil of that period and the aftermath of Vietnam played a significant role in the formation of the attitudes of those of my age. We came of age in the 1970s at a time when our society was attempting to forget Vietnam. The war that formed the images of my boyhood was described to us as either a big immoral mistake or that the war was fought incompetently. This left the subconscious impression that the government and the military were immoral and or incompetent. On top of the end of the Vietnam War, we saw a president and vice president forced to resign. Growing inflation, oil shortages, declining industry, environmental problems, and the unraveling of the great society. By the way, folks, I want to break in right here. Most of the things that he has mentioned were not real at all, but were deceptions. But you'll see its effect on society when you listen to the rest of this letter. I continue. While it is true that everyone experienced these things, these became the criteria we had to form a basic idea of what the USA stood for. In response, we became disillusioned, turned inward, and became the me generation. To many of us, it seemed that the American dream was a sham. We had been taught that the USA stood for freedom, justice, and prosperity. But to us, it seemed the only thing the USA really stood for was the right to do as we pleased and to make as much money as we could. In one sense, we were lucky. We did not have to die in war, but we also never had to fight for freedom and prosperity. The war was gone, but the anti-war protests and the civil rights movement were also gone. 
What was there to fight for? Women's rights? The environment? Nuclear power? What difference did it really make after you discovered that the government was incompetent? In your speech, you talked about each generation having its own war to fight. We did not have a war. In any sense, we didn't want one. And I have to break in here again, folks. My friend, you do have a war. And that was one of the purposes for that message. I continue. For most of us, we never had to fight for anything. The only thing we learned to fight for were market share and profit margins. Globalism seemed simply meant bigger markets and the spread of democracy throughout the world. Perhaps I'm being too hard on myself and my peers. Many of us did feel betrayed and did not like the way things were going. We considered Reaganomics a farce, but we didn't know what else to do but ride along in the wave of neoconservatism. The Federal Reserve seemed to be a hero. After all, they stopped inflation, didn't they? <laughs> Little did we realize that they set the nation on a collision course with bankruptcy. Global competition was giving us cheaper VCRs and better cars. Who cared if the factories were shutting down since we were moving to a high-tech service economy? Didn't our defense build up defeat the evil empire? Even if the Soviet government was rotting from within, it appeared that the New World Order would bring peace and prosperity to all. I, however, am a true child of the 70s, in that I have remained disillusioned. In the past few years, I have read much and thought much and have come to the conclusion that something is seriously wrong in America. Whether on purpose or through human fallibility, the elite that run things are slowly eroding our rights and destroying our economy. I find myself angry and frustrated, but without a clear enemy to attack. Is there really a global conspiracy? A good friend of mine claims the establishment is so inept that they could never pull it off. But after listening to your program for several months and reading your book, I think you may be closer to the truth than any of us wants to believe. The true enemy is hidden and elusive. Perhaps the Apostle Paul said it best in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. Quote, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Unquote. Once again, let me tell you that I was deeply moved by your program. As my friend mentioned above once said, I wish sometimes I could just go up to a vet and say thank you. So I will say it now to you all and those who fought. Thank you and welcome home. Finally, please send me your tape list and information on Kaji. I would especially like to know how to get a copy of the tape of the program I heard tonight, Friday, November 26th. It is time for me and my generation to join this fight as well. I have been reading your book, Behold a Pale Horse, and have learned a great deal from it. You might be interested to know that I found it in a bookstore in Plano, Texas, the book stop on Plano Parkway. They had four copies in the religious section. And this is signed, Daniel. Daniel, your letter is greatly appreciated. And if everyone out there would just take a good look in the mirror, as you, my friend, have done, this would be a much, much better country as little as six months from now, I can assure you. For the first step on the road to recovery is realizing that you're sick. And we've all been sick for a long, long time. I was sick for many, many years. Stupid. My brain was wasting away until I did what you have done. And I thank you for that. And now, for the nitty-gritty. Remember what I've been telling you folks? Remember the tie-ins and the symbology of the mysteries? Remember I've told you that the Cold War was a scam and that at the top they all belonged to the same organization to create a one-world government? Well, folks, the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry received its charter in the United States of America from Frederick of Prussia. Now, this is from the London Free Press, November 24, 1993, entitled Eagle May Soar Over Nation. The two-headed bird, once the symbol of czarist power, may replace the hammer and sickle. By Alexander Merkushev, Associated Press, Dateline, Moscow. The communist hammer and sickle may be replaced with a new national emblem reaching even further back into Russian history 
a double-headed eagle that for centuries proclaimed the military might of the czars. A commission to name a new national emblem rejected proposals such as bears and birch trees in favor of the golden double-headed eagle on red background. The idea was to restore Russia's historical heraldry. Even if its elements were unrelated to the current political situation, George Vilenbakov, head of the National Heraldic Service, said Tuesday, the design must now be approved by President Boris Yeltsin and Parliament. The government has wanted a new crest to replace the hammer and sickle, symbol of the peasants and workers, since the Soviet collapse more than two years ago. After the abortive hardline coup in 1991, elated citizens pulled down statues of Lenin and other communist luminaries. There have also been proposals to remove Lenin's embalmed body from its red square mausoleum. Yeltsin also replaced the red Soviet flag with a white, red, and blue banner, that also dates back to pre-revolutionary Russia. <clears throat> White, red, and blue banner. Double-headed eagle. I continue. In the spirit of the new capitalist times, the government hopes to make money by selling the right to use the new crest in trademarks and commercial logos, Commission Chairperson Rudolf Tikoya said. The eagle holds a scepter in its right talon and an orb in its left. He said in the center of the crest is an image of Russia's historic guardian, St. George, slaying the dragon. <laughs> I can't believe this. Big comeback. The double-headed eagle has already made an unofficial comeback, adorning many business logos and even appearing without its crowns and some Russian coins. Pekoya said the historic bird would replace the hammer and sickle that still adorns the badges and buttons of millions of military personnel and police officers. It will also be emblazoned on flags at Russian embassies. Let me describe it to you, folks. It is the double-headed eagle of the Roman Emperor, also the Vatican, which became the Vatican from the Roman Emperor. Rome just changed its name, folks, to the Catholic Church, and the Roman Emperor just changed his name to Pope. Now, way back when, and we're going to do a show on this very soon, the Pope united East and West to try to overcome the Reformation. He bestowed the title of Kaiser on the Russian Tsar. Kaiser in Latin means Caesar. That is the moment when Russia began using the double-headed eagle to show that the Pope or the Roman Emperor ruled the world. In the right talon is the scepter. In the left is the world, topped with a cross and crown. The sign, or the symbol, or one of the symbols of the Knights Templar. On the breastplate of the double-headed eagle is the symbol of the Teutonic Knights. Not St. George, and there is no dragon. So, folks, I know many of you have been thinking that I'm absolutely insane, but as time goes by, if you have any brains, you can see that I'm probably the only sane one that is telling you anything. You understand? Oh, and by the way, I understand from listening to Radio Free America tonight that Tom Valentine has been giving you a wonderful education on Freemasonry. <laughs> oh, my. My, my, my. I don't know what to do. Folks, uh, we're at right after the break. I'm going to uh, read to you the facts as we know them from Newsweek magazine on the suppression of the press in Canada. This is all we have to go on. I have called Newsweek magazine. They stand by their story. They claim that it is right, and we are going to air it tonight. And we're going to tell you that we have not checked it out, but Newsweek magazine swears that they stand by the facts. So, if you're in Canada and you haven't been able to learn about the Barbie Ken murders, you will tonight on the hour of the time. 